Of the Ukraine war and the ripples it sent around the globe, a main talking point at the Milken Institute's Japan Symposium underway in Tokyo. Oh, we have the chance to speak to a couple of big names uh, taking part in this event. And uh, we're going to start with Ram Emanuel, former mayor of Chicago, former chief of staff for Barack Obama when he was U.S. president, and before that, a member of the House of Representatives. Our colleagues on Asia First had a wide-wandering and exclusive interview with Mr. Emanuel this morning, and here's what he has said about Russia, the sovereignty of nations, and freedom. Being a founding member of the United Nations requires you to abide by the rules and the premise of upholding the international system. You do not unilaterally violate the sovereignty and independence of another nation. That is what's happening in the war in Ukraine, let alone the brutal attack on civilians, the brutal attack on uh, the energy system, the brutal attack on other countries' food security, and the brutal attack on Europe's energy independence. Russia undermined that system. And when you say that, it's obviously like the Prime Minister Kashida announced what happens in Ukraine yesterday could impact Asia tomorrow. But that's also true around the globe, which is why I thought one of the most powerful things going back over a year ago in the debate at the United Nations on, uh, on the March 3rd resolution condemning Russia's action came from the Kenyan ambassador, from the African Union who spoke up on the idea of the sovereignty of an independent nation, of another country violating that. Every country in Africa, based on the geographic boundaries, could spend their entire resources fighting those lines. Rather than look to the past, they realized that their responsibilities as governments and civil servants was to look to a future and build it. If Russia is allowed to get away, with undermining the international system and the UN Charter, then nothing is sacrosanct as it relates to any other country and their border and their uh, countries on their border. And either we uphold that principle that by and large has worked, good days and bad days, but by and large has worked as an international North Star, or we totally throw that out. Now, if that's a world that you want to live in, or people around the world want to live in, great. I don't think, when you look at the kids in Tehran, when you look at the people starving in uh, North Korea, you look at the people uh, arrested in Hong Kong, or you look at the million people fleeing Moscow and St. Petersburg and the young men who are sent into literally to be churned up in Bakhmut, that the people of either Iran, North Korea, China, or Russia, who have an intimate knowledge of those governments who are fleeing in one way or another, want to be part of that world. Never lose sight of the seductive pull of freedom. It has an incredible pull on both the heart and the mind. Well, the Ukraine war has strengthened the NATO military alliance as it works to help Kyiv fight back against the Russian invasion. The U.S. has also been building up alliances in Asia, prompting China to argue that the Americans are trying to create an Asian version of NATO. And here's what Ambassador Emmanuel said about that. That is just a mythology that's built as uh, basically a piñata to punch. This is countries of like-minded. Now, here's what I would do is take a step back. One, over the last uh, eight years, the wolf warrior strategy of China has backfired and backflipped on them and been an isolating rather than an engaging strategy. Two, uh, I've always viewed in the last three and a half years the three C's that have changed the world. COVID, conflict, and coercion. The supply chain con uh, problems of COVID, the conflict in Ukraine showing what Russia will do to the UN Charter in total disregard for uh, rules and international uh, system that everybody abides by, that participates in the international system, and China's active, engaged economic coercion and undermining and subversion of other countries' economic independence. So every country including the United States, is in an active engagement of reassi reassessing and reassigning resources based on the three C's and the assumptions associated with those three C's that have changed the world. You're not going back to a pre-COVID era. You're not going back to a pre-conflict era, and you're definitely not continuing on a strategy which allows China's economic coercion. 
And the United States, its allies, whether it's on the defense side, the economic side, or the diplomatic side, is involved in some way realigning its resources, its strategy, to adjust to a world changed by COVID conflict and coercion. That's what's going on. And it's not about a NATO. It's about like-minded countries realizing that their economic security, their national security, and their political security all depend about coming together and working together. And the instigator and the kind of core and crux of this is China and Russia undermining all the assumptions of a more collaborative and cooperative world. And people don't want to be a part of that. It's definitely not one unhinged of a China that economically and national security goes, looks at, does and what it does in the South China Seas, along the Himalayas, or in any other internationally recognized uh, space. No country wants to be part of that. And what China is now reacting to is they see other countries actively involved in the diplomatic side, actively involved in the, dipl in the uh, development side, and actively involved in the defense side because they know that working together is a better defense uh, against China's kind of coercion and Russia's kind of conflict. Another guest we spoke to was Stephen Chiobo, fellow at the Milken Institute Asia and the former Australian Minister of Trade and Tourism and Investment. We explain the upside of rising geopolitical tensions for businesses. Now, I firmly believe that countries can maintain policy differences, differences in world outlook, but also recognise the inherent benefits that flow to those countries, that flow to their people through liberalised trade and liberalised investment. If we retreat into a situation where countries are effectively using trade policy and weaponising it, using it as a tool against other countries, that's when it becomes highly problematic. Notwithstanding tensions that exist, there are still many opportunities to find uh, trade and investment links that can be furthered. Um, the key will be putting that into a framework that resolves differences. Now, historically, we have done that. Historically, that, of course, was done through the international rules-based order, through bodies like the World Trade Organization. Um, there's no doubt that the race is on in many respects when it comes to innovation between the United States and China. But that notwithstanding, uh, there's got to be a recognition that it's going to take time for businesses to recalibrate their supply chains, their value chains, and work out how they're going to diversify to minimise risk. Now, ultimately, if we see that the consequence of this continued geopolitical tension is that businesses and economies all around the world have a more diversified supply chain, that probably is not a bad thing. It may not be particularly efficient, but it is likely to mitigate risk, and that necessarily is a good outcome that could flow from this.